Hello, Mark. Hi there, Rupert. Hey. Um, I'm Rupert, and this is Mark Vernon. Uh, I'm Rupert Sheldrake, and we meet regularly to, or irregularly in this case, to discuss things of mutual interest. And this time, um, the discussion is on the third part of Dante's uh, Divine Comedy, Paradiso. Uh, and Mark, your wonderful commentary on it has been um, before me for the last two or three months, uh, especially on this last part, the Paradiso. And for those, do you happen to have a copy of the book handy? For I haven't actually. No, I, I should have done. I could have waved okay. it in front of people. Anyway, but, yeah. we, we can't <laughs> wave it. But it it's it, Mark Vernon's um, commentary. What's it actually called? Yes, yeah, so it's called Dante's Divine Comedy, A Guide for the Spiritual Journey. Right. Published by Angelico Press, with 100 illustrations as well as the text. Yes, well, it's a tremendous book. I mean, it, as I've said in our previous dialogues, the two on the Inferno, one on Purgatory. Um, this third part of the um, Divine Comedy is on Paradise, Paradiso. Um, your, I'd always found Dante impenetrable before, but your book has sort of opened it up and made it much easier to, to understand what's going on. And revealed to me some of the riches of this. And in some ways, the third part, the Paradiso is the most extraordinary. Um, I'll tell you what it reminded me of most, Mark, and, and, and that is a slowed down DMT trip. Um, it's an extraordinary visionary experience. And for those who haven't taken DMT, which is probably most people, it's a, the, the most powerful of the psychedelics and it has this intensely um, powerful and rapid effect. Um, and the first time I took it, far away and long ago, um, I, I had this experience at the very beginning of going through a kind of, I'm going to show, going through a kind of mandala-like portal. And it was like going through the center of a, of a flower. And that's one reason why on my book, Ways to Go Beyond, and why they work. I have this floral image on the cover because I experience as it were going through the center of the flower and then on a journey into extreme light and brilliance and color and beauty, um, ending up in a realm full of flower petals. Um, and um, many people who have DMT experiences encounter beings on their journey, people who come to them, beings of light or or, or spirits or uh, whatever. Well, that's exactly what the Paradiso is like. And it even ends up uh, with uh, the mystical rose, uh, the, this, the saints in, in a kind of amphitheater, amphitheater made out of rose petals, and they're all beings of light. And as Dante goes on this journey, guided by Beatrice, um, he encounters these various beings of light along the way, including St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Dominic and St. Bernard and Adam and, 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 and various people he knew from Florence. Um, and so for me, that, the, the, the impression was this was taking me into a completely different, non-ordinary realm of experience, which is presumably exactly what Dante was trying to convey. Yeah, I mean, I, I very much like that sense that it's a slowed down trip because I think one of the great benefits that, or sort of the one of the things that Dante offers is a way of incorporating into everyday life these otherwise ecstatic experiences that can be very life-changing in one way, but at the same time, quite hard to know what to make of. And so he is saying sort of step by step adjust, adjust yourself to the light and then it can become more and more of your conscious um, experience um, so you know he, you you learn how to follow what at first seems subtle lights and realize that they're closer to the source or you realize how light is actually all around the divine presence is all around and you can train yourself to see it um, so as William Blake put it, you learn to see through the eyes and not just with the eyes. Um, yeah, so, you know, but it's, it is, it, it's, it, Dante himself says this, this, this is the hardest part of the Divine Comedy. Um, and he says, keep close, stay with me as I describe these things, because it's almost like if you miss one step, 
um, then you, never, you may never quite kind of catch up in integrating what's perceived, what's desired, because it's as much an emotional journey as anything. But also, it's always really crucial with Dante, the intellect, trying to understand and resonate with this intuitive capacity we have um, in order to grow into what he thinks is the heart of Christianity. And with him, I completely agree. And it's the perennial philosophy, really, that we human beings, maybe other creatures too, but certainly we human beings are the invitation to us is to share more and more consciously with the divine light, to be awakened, to be enlightened. And, and so I think this, you know, the, the power, I'm so glad that you thought this and made this association because I think that's precisely the gift of especially this last part and why it's so important to get to this last part and not just stay with the inferno as so many people do. Yes. Well, one thing that I wondered was how Dante had come up with this amazing vision. I mean, it it reads as if he'd, I mean, if if I'd learned that DMT was available in medieval Florence and he'd taken it, I would sort of assume that this was a report of some kind of psychedelic encounter. But I don't suppose he was taking DMT or any other psychedelic. Uh, and, and I don't know to what degree he had spontaneous mystical experiences or to what degree he was drawing upon the writings of mystics. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that he definitely had what we would call peak experiences, um, you know, whether they were spontaneous, whether they were induced. Remember that he writes all this in a time of quite extreme distress for him as a mortal person. He's in exile from Florence. He's lost his money, he's often out of contact with his family. Um, he's very much dependent upon the generosity of others. Sometimes it's there, other times it's not. And his life is at risk for much of this time. He's told that if he returns to Florence, he'll be burnt at the stake. Um, so, you know, it's a time of deep distress. And often that makes people porous to out of body experiences. Um, and I suspect that's what induced the core sense that is revealed in the Paradiso. But then Dante's genius, and why it doesn't just stop there, is that he's both able to develop it himself, so it's not just this exceptional experience, but is able to seep into all aspects of his life and so awaken him to more and more. And then moreover, to communicate it in such a way that others can go on this journey by reading the poem. Um, and so it itself becomes a participation in his trip, in his experience, but that at once invites you to make it your own so that you resonate with it. And the light that is particular to you, that's also the divine light, might start to show up. That's certainly my experience of reading the Paradiso several times and trying to work out in this resonant way, you know, what it might mean. So I undoubtedly yes. think that. He, he was a mystic, a visionary. He had certain experiences, but he knew that the invitation is not just to stop with the experience, but to work it out and work more and more into life, therefore, and communicate it. Well, he certainly does a lot of that. And I, I would, in reading your thing, I made sort of no, lots and lots and lots of notes on, on it. There was so much that caught my attention. Um, and I actually tried to summarize the notes in this. Uh, more concisely in sort of three pages here. So there's a few points um, that I'd like to bring up with you that I've made notes on. I don't usually do this, but th there was so much here I knew I'd forget if I didn't. Um, one of the points is the brightness of the light, that it's a, it's a point that I first came across, I think, in St. Thomas Aquinas, where he's talking about the light of God and, and how the light of God is like the sun, it's much too bright for us to be able to look at throughout with our normal eyes. And this is a theme that comes out throughout the whole Paradiso. Um, he, it comes right near the beginning where he says that Beatrice can look at the sun because she's able to bear the light and that he can only momentarily glimpse the, uh, because it's just too bright for him. And part of this process is learning to be able to bear so much light, uh, being able to deal with so much light. And that reminded me of 
one or two things. I mean, one was that in uh, Rainer Maria Rilke's poems, um, he talks about how beauty is 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 terrifying in a sense because it threatens to overwhelm us and we turn away from it because we can't bear it. And he also says each angel is terrible. You know, it's terrifying to the light of these beings is dazzling and we turn away from them. And that's also a theme in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. When uh, the dead um, go into a kind of bardo, this great white light appears. And if they're able to bear the light, they can go into the light and they're liberated. But most people can't and they turn away from the light. Um, and, and then they have lesser lights that they also turn away from. They get second and third chance and so on. But it reminded me very much of that, that the uh, part of this process is learning to be fuller and fuller of light. And as he moves up through the heavenly spheres on this journey, he encounters beings like saints, like, um, like uh, St. Francis of Assisi and others who become more filled with light and angels that are beings of light. Um, and, some, and then when he finally comes to a vision of Mary, um, then Mary's so bright that she's so full of light that she's dazzling. So there's various stages of light filledness um, reaching up right to the top of the uh, celestial spheres. And that seems to be a very uh, major theme. Would you say yeah. that's one of his big points? No, certainly, yeah. I mean, it's essentially Beatrice, who's his guide in the Paradiso. A lot of her task is to kind of titrate the light that Dante can just about bear and then enable him to become acclimatized to it so that he can then make the next step, the next kind of iteration. And I think that one way of understanding it, at least, is that, you know, our separate being needs to become more and more resonant with the whole of being. And that's why some experiences can seem too bright or, you know, the beauty can seem crushing. Um, because it is too much for our separate being as it grows to join with the one being that, of course, is its wellspring and source. Um, and I, I think of it a lot in terms of virtue now, actually, that um, we think of virtues as kind of personality traits, characteristics, um, often in terms of someone behaving well. But of course, it goes much deeper than that. The point about virtues and not just moral behavior is that virtues are an expression of our being. And that what the journey in the paradise about is allowing and gradually opening our being in terms of its qualities so that it can say yes to all the qualities of the universe and ultimately of you know the Imperium, the beyond as well, the divine. Um, and the point... The double point with that is that, you know, the invitation is to know these things consciously. So it's not just a question of having the kind of blast, um, but to not lose yourself in the process, but becoming more and more and more yourself. And so becoming more and more one with the divine. It, that, that's quite a particular feature, I think, of the divine comedy, um, that it's not a loss of self in the sense that you just join a kind of undifferentiated background light, but actually the light becomes more and more particular, full of souls, but in that very fullness of souls, full of God as well. Um, I mean, you know, the obvious analogy to make there is it's, it's more like a fractal experience of the infinite in which every point leads you to the infinite rather than just an undifferentiated um, kind of light. Um, yeah, so that, that I hope, does that, does that make some sense of the, of the imagery? Yes. Um, I mean, all, as, he, as he goes on this journey through Paradiso, the, there are all these angels and other beings of light that he encounters. And of course, he also goes through the sphere of the sun as, as, a, as a source of light, and then uh, takes that light imagery right up at the end where he says, describes Christ as the son of the sun. Uh, the source of the light that is the light of the sun, um, which is a remarkable image. So it's steeped in this imagery of light. But as you say, it's not undifferentiated light because there are all these separate bodies, including dancing 
hosts or murmurations of angels. Um, and although they work together, and although they're in some cases dancing together, in other cases like notes of music, making harmonies together, um, uh, they're, so they're both coordinated in murmurations or in harmonies or in dances, and also distinct, they're, they're distinct centers of light, um, as the sun is a center of light, a, a, a body of light, uh, they're not just light spread out uniformly. And that does come across very clearly in this. Yeah, I mean, I think another way of putting it is that in this light, in infinity, freedom increasingly becomes the same thing as what we would call necessity, um, because the freedom is to share more and more in the infinite, but without limit. And so that draws us um, in a way that you know, we, 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 you increasingly don't want anything else because you know that way lies the fullness of being. Um, and so, you know, the, the finite and the infinite coincide, the imminent and the transcendent coincide. This, this other theme of the, in, the coincidence of opposites that many people report when they reflect on these kind of the heart of being. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that, that that's another way of trying to think about it. It's actually the increase of our freedom. Um, you know, it's a bit like the artist that feels compelled to make a, a, a piece of work. And although they feel compelled, it also feels like a tremendous experience of their freedom as well. Um, these intimations that we get in more usual experiences that are developing fully in Dante's experience in the paradise. Yes, and I thought that thing right again in Canto 18 is a bit where it says, you say of Beatrice, her love reflects the divine brilliance, the fullness with which longing ceases. That's very interesting, isn't it? The idea that if God is completely full and blissful, God is blissful because God is full and not trying to get anywhere else. There's this ultimate state of being, which is beyond longing because there's longing always implies some kind of lack. Uh, you want to be somewhere else. Um, and actually, you know, the, the, I think the root of the word longing is so interesting. You know, you know it's a, the Anglo-Saxon word for longing it's the same word for an erection. I mean, the longing of, of the penis is is the, the root, actually, of our word longing. It's a, a metaphorical thing, and it, I think, expresses really well, because that's a desire directed somewhere. Um, but if you're the place to which desire is directed, the ultimate state of fullness, then there's no need for longing, or longing presumably just disappears. Well, that's so interesting, because... Um, feminine in uh, imagery takes over very much in the paradise um, and there I think that this is the 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 fullness um, that is well archetypally is known in the Virgin Mary um, who said yes to God and so God could grow within her um, as much as she though was in wombing God she was she knew herself to be in wombed by God as well um, so this is a desire that's more from the longing, the direction of the purgatory, um, where people begin to trust that the lack will be made up. And it kind of morphs, I think, in the Paradiso to being the kind of lack that, you know, will always be satisfied. And so it's a journey from fullness to fullness. Um, you know, the journey through the infinite or through eternity is... Um, in a way to see the more, but also to be able to enjoy the more continually as well. Um, mm. And so the, the feminine imagery of, um, of the womb and, and gestation and birth, um, because of the yes that's been said to, you might say the eruption of God into the womb um, becomes increasingly the dominant image. Um, you know, Dante was hugely important for, um, feminine spirituality for the sense of the goddess even um, and and that aspect of desire as well well yes i mean when they're going through the sphere of venus on this journey there's there's quite a lot about the the feminine power of uh, of love in its in its feminine forms and and um, it's interesting that he goes through 
the heavenly spheres. And when he's in Venus, it's not just the planet Venus, it is also the goddess that he's talking about. Yeah, I think that, that, that this was one of the things which I struggled with a bit, because I, I confess that I don't have any natural affinity for astrology, and yet the paradise is structured, at least in the first part, which is about half of it actually, around these heavenly spheres, which are planetary spheres. So Dante journeys through, first of all, the sphere of the moon, and then Mercury, and then Venus, and then the sun, and so on, through Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, until the, the, the sphere of the fixed stars. And um, I did wrestle with quite a lot what to make with this, but I think what Dante's saying, um, which I can sort of sense wholeheartedly, is that different aspects of the natural world share in different aspects of the divine light. And that as Dante awakens to these different aspects of the divine light, he finds himself in the sphere associated with that aspect of the divine light. You know, so the moon is a kind of shifting, changing aspect of the divine light. And sure enough, um, Luna, um, the various Artemis and so on, the goddesses associated um, with the lunar light also show up because I think in a polytheistic conception that that's the presence of that, that aspect of the divine light. Um, and then it builds and gradually um, is seen to be as many reflections of the one light because it's ultimately a, a non-dual monotheistic vision of things. Um, and so this is, this has made me much more amenable when I look out at the, at the, at the stars and, and the planets now, yeah. actually, I think of them as influencing me by stirring within me the aspect of the divine that they share. Um, and so you can get a sense of the cosmos re-enchanting as a result. Um, and it's a differentiated, you know, re-enchantment. It wants to take you on a journey almost as you look at the different planetary spheres and, and feel their interior light, um, mm. which ultimately, as you say, in that beautiful image is, is that they are lights expressing the one light. Um, yes, well, yeah. rather like that is, is actually also in, in Canto 19, I made a note here because I was very struck by what you say. He encounters the eagle. Um, and then uh, what you write there is, is summarizing it is no creature possesses life, but every creature can enjoy the life that flows through it. I think that really it's the same kind of thing again, that light is, is moving. Light is, is not a static thing. It's moving, uh, in fact, at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per hour, uh, per second. Um, so the light is moving and life is moving too. It's the flow of the spirit. Um, the spirit is in light and in life. And, and this idea that all, that no creature possesses life, but life flows through it. It's really a kind of process view of nature that we get in a more secular form in Whitehead's philosophy. It's the, the process view of nature, but that comes across really clearly in, in, in these passages. Yeah, I, I think of it as, uh, again, in the paradise, reality is experienced as abundance, as generosity, um, as um, outflow, almost emanation, which is a bit more of a platonic way of putting it. But, um, and, you know, that's, again, very different from the hell, which was marked by scarcity, um, the purgatory, which is marked by the sense that there is more and more, a kind of dynamic unfolding and appearing. Whereas in the Paradiso, you're in the abundance of being. And so that is experienced as movement and dynamism. I love that um, not just the journey continues in the paradise, but um, the dynamism, the dance of reality um, increases as well. Um, and, you know, it's a bit like the, the, the trinities, which we've talked about before, you know, of Satchit and Ananda. Um, mm. But the more you know of being, the more you know of knowing, and the more you know of bliss, of dynamism as well. Um, and and when you when these three things um, come together in your own experience, um, you know that you're headed in a divine way. Um, you know, someone who experienced being as as almost flat and still and um, disappearing. Um, I think that's just the starter, and that's a bit like Dante. Um, just sensing that there's a subtle light that he can see with the mind's eye, intuits with his sense of its presence. But it's just 
a, um, a, a thread to begin to follow and that that starts to shine, to radiate and emit all these other qualities that is like Dante's journey through the paradise. Yes, well, that also um, another metaphor that um, you, you is breath, of course, for the spirit and as well as light. And I loved, again, I made a note of one of the things you wrote about Canto 4, all, sell, all souls share in divine bliss. And then you, you said some sense the eternal breathing more and some less. That's the idea. It's also sharing in the eternal breathing. It's, it's a very panentheistic view of the world, isn't it? That God is in everything and everything is in God. And um, as you point out in, in, in also that through incorporating um, these gods and goddesses from the classical world, including Apollo, the god of the sun, the Greek god of the sun, and um, the monotheistic vision doesn't exclude all these other living principles. It includes them and forms a center which gives a unity to them all. And so this image of divine light pervading all things, and then this other one of divine breath breathing through all things, they're all uh, sort of metaphors for what in more abstract terms would be called panentheism. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is taking seriously that if you are a theist of any description, um, the divine is the ground, the source, the wellspring, the imminent presence, as well as the transcendent draw um, of everything that exists. And really following that through, and of course that also, as you're intimating there, doesn't just mean that the divine breath can be sensed more and more, but that it can be sensed more and more in all places. Mm. And so it's very striking, you know, that um, one of the things that happens in the paradise, but well, it's actually, it's begun earlier, actually, you know, there were, there were non-Christians who were saved in the purgatory. The first person they meet in purgatory is actually Cato the Stoic. Um, but increasingly Dante stresses that, this is a universal vision as well, um, that Christianity, when it's really properly understood, is the return of all things to the divine where they came from. Um, and so that doesn't mean um, that you even have to be a Christian. Um, as as, the, as the, the eagle of Jupiter tells Dante um, and loves telling Dante, it swoops around him and delights to tell him um, that uh, I think the implication is that all beings are in the paradise, even those that Dante encountered in the Inferno. And when they understand their being, that will be to know that they're with the divine being once again. Um, that's their kind of task or struggle. Mm. Yeah. Um, yes. Well, that might, you might be able to illuminate, there was a puzzle here in when your commentary on Canto 9, it's related to this. Um, but you say that the quality, of, this is talking about lovers. I think we're in Venus at this stage. Um, the quality of love a person embodies affects what they can enjoy. So is that, um, I, I do mean by that, that, the experience or the kind of love that we've come to experience or know or open ourselves to affects the way in which this further development takes place? Or what do, what do you mean by that? I, th I think that's right. Um, I mean, I imagine this is a reflection on some of the figures that show up in the heavenly sphere of Venus because they're unexpected to Dante. So there's particularly there's a woman called Kunitsa who he knew in life and he knew to be her a prolific lover in life. She had four husbands and had many lovers as well. And he's a bit surprised to see her in paradise. He thinks that she might be in purgatory, but would have to kind of work out her promiscuity a bit. Um, but what she says to him is, no, that at the heart of my love of love was the love that is the love that moves the sun and the other stars. Um, and so although she says she made mistakes and it was a bit of a rocky ride at times, what was a light in her, was the divine light through this life. And so now she finds, well, she shows herself to Dante in the sphere of Venus. Um, and similarly with another figure who's a biblical figure, um, sometimes known as the whore of Jericho, Rahab. And her story is that she let the Israelites into the city 
walls of Jericho and so they're able to conquer Jericho but the and and it's very striking because Dante says that when Jesus um died and in the period between his death and the resurrection when he was searching out um all the souls in the cosmos Dante actually says at this point the first soul that Dante went to was Rahab um to rescue her and I think this must imply that um her her loving um, which on the one hand meant that she worked as a working girl in ancient Jericho, but she didn't lose touch with a kind of openness um, that meant that she was always ready to be open, not just to the Israelites coming into Jericho, but to the divine presence as well. And so was right there when Jesus um, died and rose. And so Jesus could come to her first would be the other way of putting it. Um, so it's, 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 I think it's very against the kind of moral account of Christianity as if just what you do counts. No, it's very much as, as, as you're saying there, the kind of quality, the nature, what's really alive, the spirit, the breath that's alive in what you do. And it's very hard to judge that from the outside. It may be even quite hard to judge it yourself, um, but following through what is open, what seeks more, even when it seems to make mistakes, Dante is saying is much more important in this life in order to ready us and become more and more capable for the divine life uh, well yes and again there's just one more point really about the light where um this is in canto 12 where francis of assisi is said to shine with the light of the seraphim compared with saints dominic and aquinas who shine with the light of the cherubim and the seraphim are the angels of love or divine fire, on, uh, I think, and the cherubim, the angels of divine knowledge. So here we're, we're talking about different kinds of divine light as refracted through these uh, the angels at the top of the angelic hierarchy. Yeah, so um, it's partly a debate um, within Christian mysticism as to whether love or intellect, um, and by intellect it's meant a kind of conscious resonance um, discernment awareness um, is more important and, and different mystical writers will stress different things um, you know some will say that love's more important because whilst we can't know all about God because God is ineffable we can know that God is the all and that is love which shows up whereas other writers will say no um, we because we are in our nature divine as well and that our life is the realization of that divinity so we'll understand more and more and I think what Dante says is that um, Francis who just loved nature um, is more closely associated with the seraphim in one reading um, that's the angels that just know God unmediated through pure love whereas Dominic of course is remembered as the preacher a great kind of scholar and Dominicanism is known for that um, that's more associated with the angels of the cherubim, who are just this second tier down that as the love becomes evolved, um, it becomes more discernible. And so you can say things about it. Um, but what's always crucial to remember in the Divine Comedy, and this, this is one of the first things that Dante learns, is that whilst there can be particular expressions of the divine presence, the divine light, um, any true expression is all ways also a complete expression and, and so transmits in its particularity everything as well um, this is part of the the sort of logic of infinity if you like um, and so it's sometimes remarked I'm not quite sure if I put this I might have read this since I published the book actually but um, that it has a kind of chiastic form a lot of the paradise where um, you know what seems like two separate ways of knowing God love and intellect kind of cross over and so become a complete perception of the divine. And so Dante expresses that um, in this part of the Divine Comedy because um, it's St. Thomas Aquinas, the Dominican, who talks about St. Francis, whereas it's St. Bernard, sorry, it's uh, St. Um, who is it? Uh, not Bernard, he appears later, um, but Bonaventure, St. Bonaventure, um, who's a Franciscan um, who talks about Dominic. 
Um, and so a Franciscan talks about a Dominican and the Dominican talks about Dominic. Um, and so I think what Dante is saying is that there is this debate going on. But when you see it properly, you realize these things cross over and mutually inform each other. And so, you know, the life of the seraphim and the cherubim is part of the one life. Um, you know, the angels are delighted to transmit what their, you might also almost say their kind of specialist resonance is, but that doesn't mean they don't know of all the other resonances as well. Again, it's a kind of infinite version of the fact that you might read Meister Eichhardt and discover one part of the brilliance of the divine. Then you might read a more devotional text, um, you know, like St. Francis's brother, Sun Sister Moon, and discover another part of the divine. But those things are um, just um, as much um, effusive, again, this abundance idea, um, celebration of, of the one light that's constantly differentiating, even as it's constantly showing itself to be one. Very good. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you, um, Mark. I mean, this was a wonderful experience reading your whole commentary on the divine. It's opened up so much for me that I was completely unaware of before. Um, and I do think you're an amazing guide to this great work. Um, um, you know, I, 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 presumably there's been a film of the divine or several films of the divine comedy. Yeah, I mean, as as ever, you know, there's certainly been films made of the Inferno, but um, and, and artists who have illustrated the Inferno, but um, it's the rarer ones that approach the paradise too. Um, and it's why one of the reasons why my favourite illustrator, living illustrator, is Monica Beisner, because she has illustrated all the cantos. She realised that that was absolutely crucial. Um, and and I mean, just to go back to your opening thought, actually, about the resonance with the DMT trip, um, I think that one of the reasons why Dante might be so important now is because as psychedelics become part of the culture, once again, the so-called psychedelic renaissance, um, I've been very persuaded by comments such as Michael Pollan, um, the American writer who wrote this brilliant book called How to Change Your Mind about psychedelics. And his conclusion really is the really crucial thing now is not that people have tremendous experiences which they will but that there's a culture that knows how to receive these tremendous experiences and make something of them so they can become part of the culture and not just sort of marginal experiences that people share you know almost behind closed doors um, and I, I'm so glad that that made sense to you from reading The Paradise because Dante really can now, I think, help us to know how to receive these experiences and make more of them um, so they can be properly received and not just become marginal. Well, I think, I think you're right. I think this, this is, as we enter this psychedelic renaissance, many people are having these revelatory visions. But as you say, there's, there's nothing in modern secular culture that you can map onto them. I mean, there's nothing in modern materialist science that helps you much or even in secular modern art um but this this visionary aspect of the medieval imagination and you know which is embodied in the cathedrals i think that of all the buildings that um most parallel or in some cases enhance um a psychedelic experience, the cathedrals are by far and away the ones that are most impressive because they're designed to expand consciousness. The stained glass windows are designed to take us into visionary realms of light coming through these colors and forms. And um, so I think in a sense, the cathedrals embody that kind of worldview, which Dante gave such an amazing expression to, the medieval uh, worldview. Um, and of course, they're still here. They don't require an effort of imagination to imagine those amazing spaces. You can just walk into one. And uh, a number of people find visiting cathedrals under the influence of mushrooms or cannabis or other psychoactive substances an enormously helpful way of appreciating what they're trying to do to our consciousness, expand us, expand our minds, looking up towards the heavens, seeing this 
cosmos. So the, the cathedral is a kind of mesocosm. Um, and Dante's Divine Comedy is giving us a, a, a map, a vision of uh, the heavenly and, of course, the hellish realms as well, and the realms in between. And so I think it's immensely relevant to what's happening today. And much and, and what the Middle Ages have to offer is more relevant to the psychedelic renaissance than almost anything that's happened since, in my opinion. Um, and of course, they have part of that power because they share in an animistic worldview, uh, seeing nature as alive, God in nature, nature in God, um, which traditional shamanic societies in which, in some of which psychedelics have played an important part, uh, all have that view of nature as alive, organic, interconnected, interrelated, um, as opposed to dead, inanimate, mechanical, and purposeless, the worldview that modern science, or the materialist science, offers. Um, so uh, I think it's immensely relevant. And so I'm tremendously pleased you've done this book and uh, uh, be, been a guide to the guides who guide Dante, you know, Virgil and Beatrice, um, and, and you're now a kind of modern guide to these other guides, to this uh, guidebook or visionary um, synthesis of, of where minds can go. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean thank you so much for that. And, um, you know, it, just, to, just to add that um, one of the virtues which I try to hold to is the courage to follow where the light's leading. And I think that is very much what you do um, in um, the work that you have expanded so much as well, just trying to take one step at a time and and follow where um, that takes you. Um, so to return the thanks and, but also to say that I, you know, there are, there are hopeful signs. I think that say in physics, um, well, the, the very well-known physicist, Carlo, um, Carlo Rovelli, Carlo Corelli is an organist, I think, Carlo Rovelli, um, who's, um, you know, one of the leading physicists these days and also writes very widely. Um, he's Italian and he says that he got a lot of his ideas from, on the one hand, an LSD trip, um, which he's talked about publicly, but also from reading Dante. And in particular, the way that space and time have a fundamentally relational nature, not a static structural nature, which he saw opening up and described by Dante in the Empyrean section of the paradise. And that was a direct inspiration for him in terms of them working out how that might be expressed in maths and so on. And um, so, you oh, know, yes. even in the sciences, there are the, 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 there's lots of grounds for optimism and hope, actually, that these things can cross pollinate and start to um, shape and widen the cultural discussion of these things and moving away from these mechanical models. Yeah. Well, that, of course, is one of the mainsprings of my own work, too. I mean, the being a part of a, you know, I feel Ravelli, my own work, and uh, now, luckily, quite a number of other people are working towards a recovery of a sense of the living cosmos and uh, a, a cosmos permeated with consciousness and minds at different levels of organization. Uh, I think we are coming back to it. And of course, it's at a higher turn of the spiral than that great medieval synthesis that Dante talks about. But we've got a great deal to learn from what went before, um, because for us, we're entering after a, in a post-materialist science, we're entering into a whole new way of seeing the world, but one that the materialist view hasn't really prepared us for because it's left consciousness out. And the whole point about Dante is that it brings consciousness, permeates the entire thing, the states of consciousness, the states of mind, the realms of the imagination uh, and the realms of inner experience, so what it's all about. So um, anyway, I'm very hopeful and thank you very much for doing it. Yeah, well, look, thanks for engaging with the book so fully as well, because it's obviously lovely when you write a book and uh, there's a there's a communication of something shared that arises as a result. So thank you too, Rupert.